Bosses are normally an unavoidable part of video games, locking off the rest of the game until you can defeat them in honourable single combat, or make them fall into lava. Right, exactly. Thank you, Ceaseless Discharge. But not every boss is essential for you to progress, and some of these optional bosses are so tough that only the most skilled players should even consider stepping to them in the first place, lest you discover just how good you actually are at the game you've supposedly mastered. Here then are seven super tough optional bosses that are so hard that they're for elite players only. Enjoy and beware some spoilers for the following games. One of the best ways to spend your time in Breath of the Wild, I mean apart from trying to rescue Princess Zelda from the clutches of Calamity Ganon, I'll get right on that, is doing shrines, little self-contained mini-dungeons that give you a challenge to overcome when you're presented with a spirit orb by a wizened old monk mummy. You uh, might want to give it a quick clean before you use it. The Champion's Ballad DLC added a bunch of new shrines to the game, including one which had a surprise at the end. The Monk Mummy coming to life and then proceeding to absolutely wreck your sh**. Yes, instead of just telepathically telling you good job and handing over your orb, this monk corpse, Maz Koshia, gets up ready to rumble, which is honestly the most shocking thing in Breath of the Wild outside of the electric monster Thunderblight Ganon. He then teleports you to a floating disc in the sky where the two of you throw down, you armed with easily breakable weapons and a bunch of mashed bananas, him armed with special moves from every boss fight in the game, the ability to vanish and produce clones of himself, giant spiked metal balls, a huge eye laser. This guy is like a Swiss army knife of deadly attacks and tactics so cheap he may have bought them in bulk at Costco. To put it another way, Maz Koshia is significantly more powerful than Calamity Ganon, the legendary evil that could usher in a new age of darkness. So let's be glad that he doesn't want to do that. Instead, this optional boss is guarding something much more valuable than mere peace and prosperity for the whole of Hyrule. A sweet motorbike. Looks like Zelda's gonna be waiting a while longer. This thing kicks ass. A Valkyrie. We have to save her. Think before you act. Are we prepared to face such a powerful foe? Kratos is no stranger to imposing boss battles, given his habit for getting into scraps with, you know, actual gods. Yet by far the most brutal boss fight in all of 2018's God of War is a mere Valkyrie who is, mythologically speaking, only a servant of Odin the godly Allfather. Though don't tell her I said mere Valkyrie, because she is freaking terrifying. Ah! Say hello to Sigrun, the ferocious, golden-winged acting queen of the Valkyries, who is God of War's optional endgame boss for extremely brave masochists. Sigrun is fast, hard to dodge, and has more moves than a Dancing with the Stars finalist. This is on account of Sigrun having souped up versions of pretty much all the abilities of her eight fellow Valkyries who, by the way, you had to murder on your way here, claiming each of their helmets in order to summon Sigrun, the biggest and baddest of the bunch. It would explain why she's so cross with you. The other reason Sigrun is so spectacularly pissed off is that, like her sisters, she's been corrupted by a curse. And over the course of the game, it has fallen to Kratos to lift the curse on the Valkyries by employing his core competency, which is to fight things until they're dead. Just as well, it wasn't the kind of curse that's lifted by quiet contemplation and a nice cup of tea. You have freed me from my corrupted form. You have my eternal gratitude. But my sisters remain trapped as I was. Calling Sigrun a stern challenge is like calling Kratos a bit fighty, or Atreus a bit annoying, but defeat Queen Sigrun and now you can truly say you've defeated the hardest boss in God of War and freed the corrupted Valkyries from their curse. Yeah! 
Thank you, friends. Not only that, Kratos, you've got a swish new helmet with integrated lipstick area. That's going to look great on. Ask anyone what the most emotional moment of Final Fantasy VII is, and they'll almost certainly say the moment where beloved character Ares tragically dies. Unfortunately, they're completely wrong. The most emotional moment in Final Fantasy VII is when you successfully beat the nails-hard optional boss, Ruby Weapon, which hangs around in the desert, waiting to smash you flat on your way to the Golden Saucer Amusement Park. Which is a bit like having to drive your kids past a Godzilla to get to Disneyland. Still totally worth it, obviously. Ruby Weapon is one of two huge optional endgame level bosses called Weapons that were added to the game after the original Japanese release, the other being Emerald Weapon. Now, don't get us wrong, that underwater battle against Emerald Weapon is plenty tough, particularly if you have to do it against the 20 minute time limit, which is apparently how long Cloud and his squad can hold their breath. Well, as a career as a team of world champion freedivers, if the whole hero thing doesn't work out. Ruby Weapon is an even more formidable foe though. Not just because its higher defense stat means your attacks do less damage, and not just because its attacks will rock you for thousands of hit points, but also because it can conjure a whirling vortex of quicksand to swallow up all but one of your party. I'm sure they'll be fine down there, for 20 minutes at least. So you can see why we say that actually beating Ruby Weapon is a hugely emotional, cathartic moment that you might, if you feel comfortable, want to celebrate with some sort of guttural, primal howl of triumph. But yeah, I think you can guess what the second most emotional moment is in Final Fantasy VII. Yeah, it's when Cloud and Barrett go on a date together. So romantic. What course would you have me set, Shay? Time to report back to the mentor. Wouldn't you agree? Wise words, Captain. Wise words. Assassin's Creed Rogue is an often overlooked entry in the series, which is probably due to the fact that they took Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, which was set in the gorgeous sunny Caribbean, and dumped it in the North Atlantic, where it's cold and grey and everyone is miserable. The Royal Navy attack my vessel and force my men to flee! We are stranded, and what is worse, the smugglers we were supposed to meet have been taken prisoner! Like Black Flag before it, Assassin's Creed Rogue also features ship combat with new playable character Shay Cormac's ship, the Morrigan. They will sink her! Let's put the Morrigan to the test, Captain Shay. Ready for battle, man! Also like Black Flag, if you think you're good enough at ship combat, you can choose to take on some optional boss fights against a selection of legendary ships, but nothing in Black Flag or the rest of Rogue can compare to the legendary man of war known as the Storm Fortress. There she is, Captain! The Storm Fortress! The rumors did not embellish the truth. She's a Leviathan. She's firing waters, Captain! We must get closer to the beast if we're to bring her down. The Storm Fortress isn't so much a boat as a floating city bristling with weaponry, and the fight always takes place during a raging storm, which means visibility is terrible and you're going to have a hard time even figuring out what's going on with all the fog, rain, smoke, fire and explosions going on in every conceivable direction. Fire! Pretty sure at least that this is all still taking place on the ocean. Unless those are clouds and we're 30,000 feet up in the air. It's a possibility. The Storm Fortress is also equipped with unique mortars that set the water on fire, is incredibly manoeuvrable for its size, and is the only ship in the game that fires three salvos for its broadside. Fire! 
By contrast, depending on how much time you've spent upgrading your ship, you are not as good as that. But you've got one thing the Storm Fortress doesn't have. Your loyal crew, who are full of useful advice. We should avoid her broadside, She's much too powerful there! Avoid the broadside? Oh, this is good stuff. Let me write this down. Don't get shot by all her cannons at once. Brilliant, thanks, mate. As if this wasn't enough, and believe me, it's absolutely enough, once you get the fortress's health low enough, two more ships, the Argonaut and the Scepter, join the fight, and now you have to sink them as well. I'll be honest, this is a lot to go through for bragging rights in a game no one remembers exists. With enough of those shiny little loops, I can get back to the real me. The old me. Let's get this party started. Shit's gonna get real. What's the one thing that Shang-Chi, Sonic, and Bayonetta's bartending weapons dealer Rodan have in common? Rings. All three of them have an affinity for precious mystical rings. And before you tell me the golden hoops Bayonetta collects from her fallen foes are actually halos, let's have Rodan weigh in on the distinction. I guess I'm gonna have to set up shop here and score me some halos. These stupid rings are worth a fortune back home. Who are we to argue? But where Shang-Chi needs only 10 rings for superpowers and Sonic needs but 100 rings to grant him the dark power of resurrection, Bayonetta's imposing weaponsmith is asking for 999,999 of the things if you want to purchase the platinum ticket in his cocktail lounge slash weapons emporium. Hey, if you think you've got enough halos to afford it, how about you show me some love? With enough of those shiny little loops, I can get back to the real me, the old me. Cough up enough currency though, and it turns out buying the platinum ticket gets you into an exclusive throwdown against Rodan himself, who turns out to be a powerful fallen angel known as the Infinite One. Yep, the pricey platinum ticket gets you special VIP access to having your butt kicked by your erstwhile ally in a secret hidden boss fight that's harder than a diamond-coated Jason Statham. What a great deal! By the time of Bayonetta 2, the price of the Platinum ticket has shot up to an eye-watering 9,999,999 halos. That's inflation for you, I guess, but it does still buy you the opportunity to test your witchy skills against heavy hitter Rodan, the most difficult boss in the game. What a value! If you can overcome Father Rodan's literally awesome power and win this fight, you would better hope he's still cool with selling you drinks and or weapons. Ugh. I gotta hand it to you. You sure let me have my fun. Oh, oh good. He's into it. Whew. Dark Souls 3 is already legendarily difficult. There is absolutely no reason to make it any harder for yourself. That'd be like asking someone to punch you in the mouth when you already have a mouthful of bees. If for some reason you did want to compound your own misery, you could tackle one of the game's several optional bosses that range from hideous to terrifying to hideous and terrifying. The hardest of them all, though, can be found in a location called Archdragon Peak, and is ominously called the Nameless King. I could think of some names for him. That f bastard, for example. It's not even like Archdragon Peak is easy to get to. In order to reach this entirely optional area itself, you have to perform a specific gesture at a specific location. And you can only learn that gesture by defeating one of the other optional bosses. So the Nameless King is not a boss you're going to accidentally stumble across over the course of a normal playthrough. It's almost like the game's trying to save you from yourself. Persist in trying to get to the end of Archdragon Peak, killing or avoiding the numerous extremely annoying enemies, and you'll reach the Great Belfry. Ring the giant bell there, and a storm will envelop the area, signalling the arrival of the Nameless King. Wait, he's not nameless. The King of the Storm is a name. 
That is very much a named king. Yes, it turns out that this is a multi-stage fight, and you must first defeat the boss in his King of the Storm guise, where he's riding around on a wyvern. Only after you've reduced this first health bar to zero, do you earn the right to get endlessly electrocuted and smashed about the place by the Nameless King. Easily the hardest optional boss fight in the entire Souls series. You know, now that I think about it, all the bosses in Dark Souls 3 are optional because I have the alternative option of ejecting the disc from the console and frisbeeing it into the sea. You fight a lot of different enemies in the Yakuza games, from bears... <laughs> ...to giant Roombas. By far the most deadly enemies you'll encounter in any Yakuza game, though, are the recurring optional super bosses belonging to the Armon clan, as exemplified by the fights against Joe Armon and So Armon in prequel game Yakuza 0. The Armon fights in Yakuza games exist as something of a wake-up call to players who think they've mastered every aspect of Yakuza's combat arsenal, only to face off against an Armon clan member and have their butt handed to them in humiliatingly short order. In Yakuza 0, there are two such boss fights, one for each of the game's two playable characters, Majima and Kiryu, and the two Armon bosses are both tough as nails despite appearing to be unassuming men who look like they might try and sell you a used car. Majima's fight is against Joe Armon, who has 17 health bars, which means they've gone through all the usual shades of yellow and orange and are now deep into the purples. What's worse, though, is that Joe Armon counters most of your attacks with a move where he flips backwards and hurls projectiles at you. While it seems harmless, what he's actually doing here is replacing your healing items with useless pocket tissues and even worse, a knockoff version of the game's Staminan Spark, the most powerful healing item in the game, called Staniman Spork, which instantly lowers your health to one point and decimates your heat gauge if you use it. Always read the label, kids. As Yakuza Zero's other protagonist, Kiryu, you'll be squaring up against So Armon, who starts the fight wielding a cannon <laughs> before calling in a helicopter that drops invincibility pills that he can use to become temporarily invulnerable, as well as a worrying amount of garden furniture that he can telekinetically fling into your face, stun locking you in place while it shreds your health bar. <laughs> that is So Armon. Also, I'm dead now. Well, you've defeated this video. You must be an elite YouTube watcher. But why don't you challenge these optional YouTube videos only for elite YouTube video watchers? Uh, we have one up here from us and one down there from our sister channel, Outside Extra. And if you'd like to be extra elite, you could also like this video and subscribe. Maybe even hit the notification icon.